Rock in a weary lake. Shelter in the time of storm. Yes, God is our everything. Beloved, it's good to be in your presence today to have this opportunity to <coughs> proclaim the word of God to you today. And uh, with that said, if you have your Bibles, I'd ask that you turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through seven we're going to read but we're going to put the emphasis on verses one through four first timothy chapter two verses one through seven we're not going to be able to unpack all seven verses today it's just too much too much meat in the pot too much meat in the pot with that said let us open up in a word of prayer lord we thank you for this gathering today we thank you, Lord, that we get this chance to sit under your word today. Well, so, Lord, we would ask that the collective hearts of those who are in this room would be acceptable in your sight. Mm -hmm. And that, Lord, you would help us to focus in on what your word has to say to us. Well, and then, Lord, as we always say, the grass with us, the flowers fade, but your word, O oh Lord, shall remain forever. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 In 1 Timothy chapter 2, starting in verse 1, the word of God says, First of all, then, I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions, and thanksgivings be made on behalf of all men, for kings, and all who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all God and dignity. Mm -hmm. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator also between God and men, mm -hmm. the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, the testimony given at the proper time. For this I was appointed preacher, an apostle. I'm telling the truth. I am not lying. As a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. Mm -hmm. and again, we're going to put the emphasis on verses 1 through 4. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. And I wanted to read the entire seven verses in order for us to put this in proper context. And so the tag that we're going to put on this text is just simply pray for all people. Mm -hmm. Pray for all people. Amen. Amen. The church, if there's anybody who knows what it means to pray for all people, it would be the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul knew experientially what it meant to be a recipient of the prayers of other people. For I am reminded that in the seventh chapter of Acts, there is an instance where Stephen, a preaching prototypical deacon, was standing before a crowd and preaching the gospel. And he preached the gospel so eloquently that the people got mad. And they began to pick up rocks and began to attempt to stone him, but there was a young man who was also standing in the crowd by the name of Saul of Tarsus. And Saul of Tarsus, Acts chapter 7, verse 59 says, he was there giving his consent for the murder of Stephen because he was holding their clothes. But what I like about Stephen is, is even with that form of persecution, Stephen was praying. With that kind of persecution, facing death, in the face of death, Stephen is praying. And what Stephen prays in the 60th verse of Acts chapter 7 is, do not hold this sin against them. Mm -hmm. And of course, as we already said, 
uh, Saul of Tarsus, who we affectionately now call the Apostle Paul, was standing in that crowd. And apparently God must have heard <clears throat> the prayer of Stephen. And he not only heard the prayer of Stephen, but he answered the prayer of Stephen because Saul of Tarsus was converted to and he became saved. So when we come to this text before us, we have the Apostle Paul, now an old man, writing to a young man in the faith about the importance of praying for all people. And you know what, church? We all ought to be able to agree well. that every church should Ought to be a praying church. Amen. And not only should every church be a praying church, but we all ought to be able to agree that every Christian ought to be a praying Christian. Mm -hmm. Because prayer is not only important to the life of the local church, prayer is vital to the overall spiritual well-being of every single Christian. Mm -hmm. Listen, attempting to live the Christian life Apart from being a praying Christian is a fool's error. Come on, dog. It's a fool's error. Because uh, there is no way that we can possibly live the Christian life apart from an ongoing talking and walking with Jesus each and every day of our lives. Stand on it, dog. So living the Christian life apart from prayer is an activity with absolutely no hope of success. And the reason why prayer is so successful in the lives of Christians, in the life of the church, in this world, is because, as Ian Bounds once said, prayer moves the hand mm -hmm. that moves the world. And so there is a lot of activity that we can be engaged in, y'all. All right. But I believe the, the most important activity that we can be engaged in as Christians is the activity of prayer. Mm -hmm. See, our Lord wants the church to be a house of prayer. And you know what else? Prayer takes discipline. Mm -hmm. It takes discipline. It's a discipline that we have to be growing deeper in each and every day of our lives. Because if you're like me, I pray every day. Mm -hmm. But sometimes my prayers aren't as deep as they need to be. Bad Amen. Bad sometimes my prayers are some of them little 30 second prayers. Mm -hmm. Or some of them are the memorized prayers. Now I lay me down to sleep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I pray the Lord my soul to keep. Mm -hmm. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. Okay, time to go <laughs> All right. And then the church, sometimes our prayers need to be a little deeper than that. Right. And, and understand this as well, church. We ought to never underestimate the power and the importance of of prayer. Well, because no matter what situation we are facing in this life, my God. And we all got all kinds of issues that we're facing in this life, aren't we? Yes, sir. We can always pray. We can always pray, regardless of whatever the situation is, whatever the trouble is, whatever the circumstance is, we can always pray. Talk to me. As a matter of fact, when life is rough, we need to pray. Yeah. Yes. When life seems to be going right, you know what? We need to pray. And the purpose of prayer is to allow God to manifest his glory in our lives and the lives of those that we are praying for as a response or an answer to our prayers. Mm -hmm. For I believe God is still in the prayer answering business. Amen. Oh, yes, he is. Amen. He's still in the prayer answering business. So when we come to these verses that are before us today, what we find again is Paul writing to Timothy, his protege in the ministry, 
And as you all know, uh, Paul left Timothy in Ephesus to contend for the gospel, defend the faith, but he not only left him in Ephesus to contend for the gospel, defend the faith, Paul left Timothy in Ephesus so that he would be the kind of pastor, the kind of leader who would make praying a priority. Well, yes. Praying for all people as a priority. And so praying, y'all, for all people is the most important thing we can do as a local congregation. Mm -hmm. And you know what else? Looking at these verses that are before us, what we get is we get some insight as to the what of praying for all people. The whom of praying for all people and the why of praying for all people. Hmm. And regarding the what of praying for all people, as Christians, we pray all kinds of prayers. Regarding the, the whom, when it comes to praying for all people, as Christians, we pray for all kinds of people and all kinds of prayers. Mm -hmm. And regarding the why as to praying for all people, we pray all kinds of prayers for all kinds of people because God desires all people to be saved. Yeah. Did y'all get that? Yeah. We pray all kinds of prayers for all kinds of people because God desires all people to be saved. Mm -hmm. And the kinds of prayers that we ought to pray is found in verse 1 of this text before us. And it mentions entreaties, prayers, petitions, and thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. You see that? Mm -hmm. Entreaties are simply requests which speak to our needs. We go to God and we supplicate. We make our request known unto God what it is that we stand in need of. In other words, it's me. Mm -hmm. It's me, O oh Lord, standing mm -hmm. in the need of prayer. But not only is it us, but we also go and we pray for the needs of others. Mm -hmm. And saints, understand this. God wants to supply our needs and not our greeds. Because a lot of time I suspect that we spend a great deal of time pray, praying for our greeds. Amen. And not necessarily our needs. Because what we think is a need oftentimes could be considered a greed. I mean, we got a house, but we asking God for a bigger house. <laughs> we got a car, and we asking God for a bigger car. We got to a family. Well. And we asking God for an even larger family. Nothing wrong with that. But we must understand that Philippians 4.19 tells us that our God will supply all our needs. According to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. And church, you know what? That's a promise that we can hold on to today. Mm -hmm. When we feel like our lives are going through the south part of hell, the south part of Gehenna, that's a promise that we can hold on to today. Because all of the promises of God are yes and amen in him. But Paul doesn't just mention entreaties. He mentions prayers. And, and, and this term for prayers is really an overarching general term for worship. Worship. It's prayer as worship directed towards God. Did you all know that prayer is worship? Mm -hmm. And that prayer and worship go together? Mm -hmm. Worship and prayer go together? And it's an act of worship that ultimately manifests itself through our praise. Right. Saints, there is an inextricable link between what we pray and how we praise the God that we are praying to. Mm. See, our prayers ought to lead us 
to praising him. Well, and our praise ought to lead us to praying to him. See, we need to pray to our God. Well, and we need to praise our God. Amen. We praise our God because we understand that it is from him that whom all blessings flow. Amen. Paul mentions prayers, entreaties, but next he mentions uh, petitions. Petitions. And petitions speak of boldly interceding on behalf of others. Well. Church, prayer is about us. And yet, prayer is not always just about us. Y'all hear me? Come on. When it comes to prayer, we you know what we do. We often get our list together. <laughs> we get our list and we check it twice. And we're praying to God about our stuff while neglecting to pray for other people's stuff. And praying for <laughs> others is what we call intercessory prayer. Intercessory prayer is simply praying on the behalf of others. Mm -hmm. We're asking God to step into that person's life. On, We're asking the Lord to move into that in that person's life in such a way that they will know for certain that it is God who has moved in their lives. Yeah, yeah. And church, we are never more like Jesus mm -hmm. than when we are interceding on behalf of somebody else. Mm -hmm. you know, Thanksgivings. Mm -hmm. Thanksgivings, which refers to praying with the spirit of gratitude mm -hmm. that God is actually even giving us the opportunity to even pray to him. I mean, don't you all know that God doesn't have to hear our prayers? Mm -hmm. We ought to be grateful that God hears our faintest cry mm -hmm. and that he answers by and by. Church, when God answers our prayers, it's not an opportunity for us to pat ourselves on the back and congratulate ourselves because we got a prayer answered to. All we can say when God answers our prayers is simply thank you. Yes. And telling the Lord thank you is having good manners. Because there are only two times in life when we are to tell the Lord thank you. That's when you feel like it. And when you don't. Amen. And beloved, whenever the Lord does anything for us, we need to learn how to say thank you. Thank you, thank you Lord, for the promise of prayer. Thank you, Lord, for the peace that comes by prayer. Thank you, Lord, for the power of prayer. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege of prayer. Thank you, Lord, for the priority of prayer. Thank you. Because it was the Lord himself who said, man, not to always pray. Always pray and not give up. Amen. Always pray and not throw in the towel. Mm. I know there's going to be some days when you feel like you're about ready to throw in the towel. Amen. There's going to be some days and times yeah. in yeah. life where we all yeah. feel like we're ready to give up. Yeah. But our Lord said, instead of giving up, pray up. Amen. So, don't give up mm -hmm. on praying. Don't give up on praying for your family. Mm -hmm. Don't give up on praying for your children. Mm -hmm. Don't give up yes. on praying for your grandchildren. Mm -hmm. Don't give up praying for your church. Yeah. Don't give yeah. up in praying for right. God to increase your faith to see what you can't see mm -hmm. in front of you right now because we walk by faith. And not by sight. Yeah. Saints, don't give up praying for the good, the bad, and the ugly. Right. Never forget, mm. never forget mm. that we can go to God and pray to Him as often as we need to. My God. As the hymn writer once said, Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, what needless pains we bear, all because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. We can pray all kinds of prayers. We can pray all kinds of prayers for all kinds of people. It's right there in the text. In 1B and verse 2. Verse 1B and verse 2. It's right there. He says that all kinds of people are for all men. You see that? For kings and all who are in authority. In other words, we can pray for local officials such as city council members. We pray for mayors. We pray for state officials. We pray for state representatives. We pray for the governor. We can pray for civil servants like police officers, firefighters. We can pray for federal government employees. We can pray for the, the President of the United States and we can pray for those in the House of Representatives and those who are in the Senate of the United States. Because you got to understand, this was radical for the Apostle Paul to say, pray for all men, kings, and those who are in authority because you got to understand this, Nero was the emperor of Rome at that particular time. And Nero killed Christians for sport. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, he killed Christians for sport. And he not only killed them, but he burned their bodies like tiki torches mm -hmm. and lined them along the street. Mm -hmm. And so when Paul was saying, pray for kings, can you imagine Timothy looking, what you talking about, Paul? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Did you talk about praying for Nero? Pray for Nero? Yes, pray for Nero. Nero needed to be saved too. Amen. So we pray for kings. We pray for the president. We pray for the governor because the governor and the, and the president, they need to be saved too. Those who are in the halls of Congress, they need to be saved too. We pray that God would give them wisdom to govern in a way that is pleasing in his sight. Talk to me. That the Lord will use them in such a way that they don't violate us in the way we serve the Lord in this country yeah. and in countries all over the world. Right. Because, you know, it's a blessing to live in the United States and have the opportunity to worship with the freedoms that we have here. Yeah. Because all of our brothers and sisters around the world in Christ can't do what we're doing right now. Yeah. And so prayer is the key that changes the world. My God. And can I encourage us today, church, to spend more time in prayer? More time in prayer. If we want to see the salvation of our nation mm -hmm. and its leaders, if we want to see the hearts and the minds of the people of this nation turn back to God, let us spend more time in prayer. Mm -hmm. Less time in political activism and antagonism. Mm -hmm. More time in prayer. Because God can accomplish much through prayer. Well, the, the, the heart of the king is in the hands of our great God. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. See, it's hard for us to be mean to somebody that you pray for. Watch out. Have you ever found that out? And yeah. if, if you pray for somebody... I want you to try that out. Try that. Test it. <laughs> Test it on somebody that is, is rubbing you the wrong way. <laughs> Test it on some of them sandpaper people in your life. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they, it just no matter what you say or what you do, it just seems like, you know, they just rub you the wrong way. Ooh, Start praying for them. Mm -hmm. And if God doesn't change them, he'll certainly change your disposition for you. <laughs> I'm a witness. <laughs> yes. And so church, we must never forget to, that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They are not of the flesh. They are divinely powerful. Well, They pull down strongholds. 
And so the benefit of praying for the king and those who are in, in authority is also found in the text in verse 2. That we may live tranquil, peaceful, that is, and quiet lives in all godliness and dignity. Dignity can be translated as holiness because tranquil is better translated as peaceful and quiet refers to the absence of external disturbances. And so we want to be able to practice our faith peacefully well. in quietness. We, we're not called to be uh, we're not called to be anarchists agitators who want to overthrow the government. We, we want to practice our faith in peace and quietness. Well, mm. And so when we as believers are promoting peaceful and quiet living, you know what? It comes about as we are pursuing godliness. It's right there in the text, which is living our lives for the glory of God. Mm -hmm. But notice again that uh, tranquil and quiet living also comes because we are in pursuit of holiness. The text uses dignity, or if you got the KJV, it uses dignified. And the word for dignity carries the meaning of being pure, <clears throat> sanctimonious. Or simply put, just holy, reverent, respectable. And as Christians, we ought to be the kind of people who are known for our commitment to, to being holy, to being respectable, to being reverent in our behavior. Because peaceful and quiet living comes as a result of holy living. Well, and we serve a God who wants his people to be holy. Mm -hmm. We serve a God who wants his people to be dignified. Mm -hmm. and, and being dignified doesn't mean that we will not have problems in this life. Come on, God. Come on. Because the Bible has already told us in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, that all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Well. So saints, if we are persecuted, let it be because... Mm. We are living godly lives mm -hmm. and not ungodly lives. Mm -hmm. see, see, Paul told the saints at Thessalonica in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 11, he said that we need to lead quiet lives mm -hmm. and tend to our own business. Come on, son. In other words, the Jenkins translation would just simply be, you know, we need to live quiet lives and mind our own business. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. We need to mind our own business by being mindful of our witness. And our witness for Christ will either draw people to Christ or it will drive people away from Christ. So we need to be minding our own business by being mindful of our witness. Because the world is watching us. Amen. Yes, the world is. Amen. They're watching us to see if we are who we say we are. Mm -hmm. They're watching us to see if we're mindful of our witness and if we are minding yeah, mm -hmm. our own business. Mm -hmm. And when the culture is critical of us, mm -hmm. we need to be mindful of our witness and we need to be minding our business. Mm -hmm. So church, listen. We can pray all kinds of prayers for all kinds of people mm -hmm. because God desires all people to be saved. Amen. It's right there in the text. Yes, sir. Verses 3 to 4 which says this is good and acceptable mm -hmm. in the sight of God our Savior who desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. 
And this is pointing to the command that Paul has already given in verse 1 of chapter 2. And, 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 and basically, in other words, it, it simply means that to the church, we should have genuine concern for all people. Mm -hmm. Friends and foe alike. We should have concern for all people. Praying for all people is good and acceptable. Mm -hmm. Because praying for all people pleases God. Amen. Yes. More than anything else. We should want our lives to be pleasing to God. Mm -hmm. Saints, we ought to want the Lord to be pleased with us more than the world is pleased with us. Mm -hmm. We ought to want the Lord to be pleased with us more than the world is pleased with us mm -hmm. because uh, we love Jesus mm -hmm. in a world that gives lip service to him. So praying for all people pleases God, as the text says, our Savior. Our God isn't just our provider. Well, our God is our Savior. Amen. Our God hmm. isn't just our healer. Mm -hmm. Our God is our Savior. Mm -hmm. Our God isn't just our creator. Well, our God is our Savior. Make it clear. Our God isn't just our sovereign king. Mm -hmm. Our God is our Savior. Yes, As a matter of fact, our God is Savior, desires all men to be saved. Mm -hmm. To come to the knowledge of the truth. Well, yes, the reason our God desires all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth is that God wants everybody to have a bona fide, genuine opportunity come on, come on, to be able to respond to the clarion call to repent and believe in Jesus. Mm -hmm. So the reason prayer is made for all men is we don't know who the elect are. Come on, dog. Right we like the soul of spreading seed. Mm -hmm. We just indiscriminately yeah. just spread seed because we don't know. We're spreading gospel seed. We don't know who's saved. We don't know who the elect is and who the who who is not the elect. Mm -hmm. We don't know who God is going to move on to respond to the gospel call. Tell it, tell it. Yet the question we got to ask ourselves today is does all men it's right there in the text or all people refer to all men individually or all sorts or kinds of men this is what we do when we start interrogating this text and so when we look at the text Church, we need to understand that 1 Timothy 2 and 4 doesn't exist on an island by itself. Mm -hmm. But it's surrounded by a group of verses. And with this in mind, y'all, we must understand the phrase all men, all people, doesn't mean every single person in the phone book that we may call on mm -hmm. for prayer. Mm -hmm. The phrase all men, all people, Everyone, pos, anthropos. It first occurs in verse 1 of this same chapter. It has a wide range of meaning individually. Each, every, any, all, the whole, collectively. And the context determines the meaning. So the phrase. In the verses before us, explains, especially in verse 2, explains Paul's meaning of all men. It's all kinds, all those in authority. Who are those in authority? Kings. There are all kinds of men, as stated in verse 2, kings. 
and all who are in authority. Mm -hmm. Some or some types of classes of men. And so why is this important? It's important because church, we must ward off against Paul teaching some form of universalism whereby everybody is ultimately saved in the end regardless if they believe in Jesus or not. Well, And we know biblically speaking that is not true. Mm -hmm. So Paul is not teaching here some form of, of universal salvation because although God desires all men to be saved, all men, everybody not going to heaven. As we say in the church, everybody talking about heaven ain't going. Mm -hmm. See, everybody is not saved. So he has to be referring to all kinds of men and not just in general, every single person in the world. Mm -hmm. So it's, consist it's consistent, y'all, that within this context, he's using all men generically. To refer to all kinds of people. Mm -hmm. And the reasons Christians, the reason we pray for all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth is because there is ultimately one God mm -hmm. and one mediator between God and man, Christ Jesus, the man. Make it clear. And the fact of the matter is, is that the atonement of Christ, mm -hmm. it is sufficient to save all. Yeah. However, it's designed to actually save even the elect. Well, yeah. The atonement is unlimited in its sufficiency, but it's limited in its application. And so, to, the call to come to Christ is a universal, bona fide, genuine offer. The call is given to every single human being on the planet Earth. Amen. But how many of us know that many are called? Talk to me. And a few are chosen. Amen. Yes, there are those in the world who are going to be like what uh, Paul described to the saints at Thessalonica in 2 Thessalonians 2 and 10, who refuse to love the truth and so be saved. And although Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, mm -hmm. no one comes to the Father except by him. There are those who will reject the love of Jesus and so be saved. Mm -hmm. And so, there are some who will not be saved right. because they don't love the truth. They don't love Jesus. So the meaning, again, for all men flows through the entire context of 1 Timothy chapter 2, 1 through 7, which is the reason why we read it in its entirety, because we needed to set these four verses in their <laughs> context. Mm -hmm. And so God, and it's his will to save all men. Mm -hmm. But what we need to understand is, is what do we mean by the will of God to save all men? God desires all men to be saved. But what God desires has to be distinguished from what he has actually decreed. Because what God desires is often resisted. But what he is decreeing will never be resisted. Well, what God has decreed, it shall come to pass. Mm -hmm. Yet what God desires, it's often violated. Well, I mean, God doesn't desire that any of us in here sin, but we sin, right? Amen. So we have to understand the difference between what God desires and what God decrees. And there is a parallel statement, the knowledge of the truth, 
that is found in verse 4 of 1 Timothy chapter 2. The parallel statement is found in 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 25. And the parallel statement again is ace epignosin aletheia. The knowledge of the truth. The knowledge of the truth. It's the same statement in 2 Timothy 2.25, the knowledge of the truth that we see in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4. And so the question again we got to ask ourselves is what is the decisive factor? What is the reason all people aren't saved? The decisive factor is ultimately because God has sovereignly chosen for his own purposes to grant repentance to some leading to the knowledge of the truth and not great repentance to others. Mm -hmm. And somebody may say, well, well, God is being unjust. Mm -hmm. God is under no obligation to save anybody. Oh my God. Mm -hmm. There are some in this world who are going to get much mercy. There are some who are going to get justice. Mm -hmm. There is nobody in this world who will get injustice. Mm -hmm. Yes. There is nobody who gets injustice with God. Some get mercy, some get justice, but nobody gets injustice with God because faith is the gift. Repentance is the gift. And the gift of faith and repentance in Christ Jesus is something that we can all praise God for. Man. See, God doesn't choose anybody for salvation based upon the choice that we make. Mm -hmm. Our God is not sitting in heaven waiting for us to make a decision before he decides to save us. Mm -hmm. Church, we've been saved for his purpose and not our purpose. Mm -hmm. Salvation is ultimately God's purpose. And so, we have been saved. Those of us who are saved today have been saved by his power. We've not only been saved by his power, but we've been saved for the pleasure of his good will. Mm -hmm. We've been saved to do his will. His good pleasing and perfect will which is ultimately for mm. us to pray for all people well but not only this as we draw near to our close we have been saved to the praise of his glory I'm reminded that Romans 11 says it this way for from him and through him and to him are all things and to him be glory forever and ever. See, our salvation is not for our glory. Mm -hmm. It's for God's glory. Man. So we praise God for his glory. Mm -hmm. We praise him for his excellent greatness. Mm -hmm. And the reason we praise him for his excellent greatness is because God was merciful enough. God was gracious enough. God was loving enough to choose us, to bring us into the family of God. Hence, we are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. That we may declare the praises of him who brought us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if the hymn writer was here, he'd simply tell you, blessed assurance, mm -hmm. Jesus is mine. Yeah. Oh, what a foretaste yes, of glory divine. Mm -hmm. I'm an heir of salvation, purchased of God, born of his spirit, washed in his blood. That's my story. That's my song. I've got to praise my Savior all the day long. So let everything that has breath praise ye the Lord. 
God bless you. And may heaven smile upon you. Perhaps there may be somebody here today that doesn't know Jesus as Savior and Lord. Well, the Bible says that if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord and that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Amen. If you want to know more about what it means to be a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, just come see me out in the service and I'll do the best I can to explain what it means to be a disciple of Christ.